pray with me. Amazing God, may the meditations of my heart and the words of my mouth be pleasing to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. Grace and peace to you from God, for our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Have you heard the one about the pastor who announced earlier this month that he is going to live as an atheist for one year to see how it is to be a person with no faith? Ryan Bell, a pastor out of California, isn't the first pastor to ever announce some sort of stunt to try to bring some attention to the church. I mean, pastors do stunts in churches for all sorts of reasons. Sometimes it's to raise money or to raise attendance at their services and to try to bring in new members. Sometimes it's to sell a book or to raise their notoriety in our cultural landscape. Sometimes it's even to proclaim the gospel, actually, and to try to lead people into a relationship with our amazing God. The Religious News Service posted an article online recounting 12 common modern-day pastor stunts. They include the pastor dressing up as a homeless person and then hanging outside of the church before services on a random Sunday morning just to see how the church members would respond. Another one is known as the 30-day sex challenge. The pastor challenges the members of the church in a committed relationship to have sex every day for a month to just see what happens. Are you interested? Then there's the losing weight for the Lord challenge. Uh, most recently, Pastor Rick Warren from Saddleback Community Church is known for this. They have a diet made up out of the book of Daniel and other pages of scripture. It's supposed to support you in your weight loss. Then there's the one made famous by Oral Roberts, the send me money or else stunt. <laughs> February of 1987, Oral Roberts told his followers most famously that if he did not raise $8 million over his regular ministry expenses by the next month, that he would die, that God was going to call him home. Some pastors even put themselves up on the roof of their building or inside of a, a acrylic box for all the world to see, and they're not coming down until they get enough money to renovate or rebuild whatever they are renovating or rebuilding. The article from the Religious News Service goes on and tells us there are then professional stunt ministries, like Real Encounter or the Kingdom Stunters, an action sports outreach ministry, a motorcycle team with a desire to reach the lost for Jesus Christ. Founded in 2009, the team travels to church fairs and around the country. One of the first and flashiest, however, is Georgia-based pastor and motorcyclist Aaron Ramsey, who was inspired by Evil Knee. Ramsey runs the Jumping for the King ministry and jumps buses in church parking lots, sometimes for all the fire. All of these stunts have one thing in common. They are used by people who are trying to reimagine the church. They are, by their actions, trying to help the church discover who they are and what they stand for in a new way. <clears throat> the thing is, as flashy as these stunts are, they are simply attempts to answer one of the oldest questions of our faith. How does one best become the church? And that is what Paul is trying to tell the church in Rome here, how to be the church. Not one for gimmicks, Paul sticks to what we know now as to be the foundations of our faith. Our readings from the 12th chapter are Paul's guidelines for Christian living. He specifically mentions seven gifts of grace. Prophecy, service, teaching, encouragement, giving, leadership, and showing mercy. Paul writes, We have different gifts that are consistent with God's grace and that has been given to us. If your gift is prophecy, you should prophesy in proportion to your faith. If your gift is service, 
devote yourself to serving. If your gift is teaching, devote yourself to teaching. If your gift is encouragement, devote yourself to encouraging. The one giving should do it with no strings attached. The leader should lead with passion. The one showing mercy should be cheerful. These gifts, when done in love, the love we discover when we enter into a relationship with Jesus Christ, will guide us to be the church that God wants us to be. Each of these gifts we carry are a gift from God, a sign of God's grace. And when we allow ourselves to each use our own gifts together, we are the church. When you study Paul and his writings, you quickly realize that Paul believes that we are all given specific gifts from God that we can bring to the table. Our job as faithful believers is to discover these gifts, to nurture and accept them as a sign of God's grace in our lives, and then to let ourselves use these gifts to guide ourselves and others into a most beautiful relationship with an amazing God. Read between the lines of much of Paul's writings and you'll find encouragement. You'll find the unspoken message of Paul going, if you do this, everything else will take care of itself. If you take care of what God has given to you, God will take care of the rest. So you can see how important it is for us to be able to discover and accept and tend to the gifts that God has given each and every one of us. Have I ever told you the story behind the, the pyramids, the wall hangings that are hanging up here in the church today? These painted fabric wall hangings are the result of a church retreat that our church council attended here at the beginning of last year. We met in the chapel and spent a time in prayer reading scripture. We sang a song to praise God and we moved into the Ellis room. There we looked at all sorts of facts and figures that pertained to churches like us, churches of our size, churches with our history. And we looked at how other churches like us discovered how to reimagine their purpose and vision so that they could grow and become revitalized as communities of faith. After looking at all of the data and the studies, we came to a point where we needed to discern, as pastor and counsel, where we were being called by God to be as a church. So we made a list that's up here on this board entitled Prayers for Our Church. Our church council broke up into three small groups and they talked to each other in these small groups about who they believed we were being called by God to be. Then we came back together and we shared our discoveries with each other. And that's where this page of thoughts up here comes from. It's been hanging in my office ever since as a reminder of the work that we've done there. As you can see, it has a whole list of things that we were thinking about for who we were called to be as a church. And we only did this about two months after I came in as your current pastor. You can see that it lists come together as a community. Honor the past and passing it on. The gospel. Giving inclusiveness. Growth in community. Growth. Spiritual and membership growth. Empowerment of membership and growth. Harmony to be created in the church to equal growth. Bonding, harmony, transforming experience. Thrive, not just survive. Spiritual growth, individual and group experiences. Thrive in relationship to our finances. My favorite, a bastion of equality and justice. To reach out with our message. And finally, strength slash money slash spirituality. And these were prayers for, for the church. This is the vision 
for who our church council feels we are called to be by God. And these pyramids, these, these wall hangings, they have the inspiration of trees, a symbol for renewing growth and strength. And the words that are painted on that fabric come from this sheet of paper right here. These banners serve as a living prayer lifted up by our church council for the church. They were lovingly made in part or all by Peg Thornton, Judy Jackson, Mary Neller, Sherry Sandberg, Bob Schaefer, and Lynn Young. Last year, I preached a sermon entitled The Three Bs. The three Bs are our building, our budget, and our Bibles. All areas of concern for our faith community and all areas that needed our attention. Addressing these concerns as we have and continue to do, we are now ready to move on to the next steps in our journey of faith as a church. It's time for us to recommit to being transformed by the gospel, by using our gifts and graces to lead others and ourselves into a more committed, a more fully realized relationship with Jesus Christ. And that means embracing who we are and being the best church that we can be. Now that the three B's have been taken care of, we have a new focus for a new year. You may notice that one of the repeated words on the church council's prayer list is obviously growth. And I see many of us every week counting how many people we have in worship. Underneath all of this is the idea that in some form that us that we are a small church, and that maybe a small church in number is not such a good thing, that a small church is not as good or as successful as a larger church. But I'm here to tell you today that that simply isn't true. Small churches, when healthy and living a life where they embrace their gifts and graces from God and share them with others, are some of the most beautiful places in the world. Carl Laters writes about the benefit of being a small church. These benefits are a list of some of the gifts and graces we need to embrace here in order to continue to become that bastion of equality and justice, the spiritual home for sharing God's love and grace and mercy in our community. Bader notes among some of the small church's greatest gifts a family-style friendliness. Access to the past, cross-generational worship, a chance to learn, a chance to grow, and a chance to lead. Personalized, relationship-based discipleship. And my favorite, the opportunity to know and to be known, to not be anonymous. This is our new focus as a church, to be the best at offering these things to each other and to the people who we have just met or have not even met yet, who will be coming through our doors soon enough. And like Paul's encouragement written between the lines of his letters, I truly believe that if we do this, God will take care of the rest. Now we've had a wonderful, challenging, hard-working, faith-affirming year from congregational meeting to almost and now postponed congregational meeting. We've covered a lot of ground as a community and as a result, we are all the better for it. We have done a lot of work. Our finances, our bylaws, our building use, our staff and policies, our governing organization, our application of mission and worship have all been transformed by our desire to better bring the gospel of Jesus Christ into our lives and into our community. This has taken a lot of dedication and hard work on behalf of our church council, and I personally thank all of them for their commitment to the church, to the gospel, to the amazing love of our amazing God that sincerely hope is the driving force behind everything that we do. 
what would have been today after worship will now be on February 9th. We'll meet in the Royce Room for our annual congregational meeting where we will say thank you to four members of our, of our church council rotating off of their terms of service. And all of them have been instrumental in providing us with the smooth and successful transition that we have experienced as I have become settled as your pastor. Reggie Stevens was the first person to truly open her heart up to me in our community. From the first moment we met to a faithful conversation on the couch in the parlor on my call weekend, and continuing until this present day, she has been a true gift. Her loving attention to the details of our worship is only surpassed by her true spiritual gifts as a loving friend and that of prophecy and that of extending mercy. Steve Poyser has a mind like a steel trap and the memories of so much of the history and practical information about everything around him filed away in that computerized mind of his. That one call to him on the phone will usually save the day. He and his wife have freely opened up their home and their farm to us as genuine hosts, and his dedication to the service of this church as an honest advocate for our community has served us well. Steve shares his many gifts with us so freely. Certainly two of his most noted gifts are that of service and encouragement. Now, Kelly Ryder stepped down last year to attend to graduate school, and this week her portfolio of Christian education will be formally filled by Janet Pontius. While stepping off of the council last year, Kelly has stepped up to fulfill the needs of the congregation that we have for music direction and leadership. Her gifts are instrumental to our growth as a community, as I've said before, a church with no music is truly like a child with no soul. Kelly's service on the council is commendable and considerable, and I also offer great thanks for her willingness to help co-facilitate our music. Her gifts of teaching and giving continue to nourish our journey into becoming the church that we are called to be. And finally, Rick Hunsicker has served our church as a faithful moderator through a very difficult transition in our church's history. Always a calm and steady presence of clear thinking and faithful stewardship, Rick has allowed us to see the light of day through some pretty dark times. Our transition from an intern to a settled pastor, our bylaws, our membership definition and our four, our finances, and the ability to see a viable future, as well as our complicated relationship with Little Cherubs made for an exciting tenure, to be sure. Rick has been the calm in the storm for many in our community. His gift of leadership and commitment to the gospel with a no-bullshit attitude of love and grace has been nothing but a gift for us as a church and as an example for others to live into. I tried to think of a different word, but the way that Rick led, I had to say bullshit. <laughs> Now, all of these council members have something in common. First, they are dedicated to the life and the ministry of this church and the gospel of Jesus Christ. They have shown that in spades. Second, they all have a long history of serving the church in a wide variety of roles and will continue to do so after their tenures are completed. And third, they were willing to let their faith guide them and us into an exciting possibility-filled future that we are looking into today. We owe all of them a great deal of thanks and respect for their service, and I truly and humbly say thank you. Now, I can go on and on. The gifts of so many have all each contributed to the very favorable and grace-filled place we find ourselves today as a community, but I'm going to save my accolades for the rest of you one-on-one. -on -one. As we move forward, we are welcoming William Coffey, Don Cheeseman, Amanda Shelley, and Marie Cobb onto the church council. And they will join Don Hansen, Peg Thornton, Don Franzen, Dennis Anderson, Janet Pontius, Holly Schaefer, Jason Moreno, and Dick Dunn. 
Together, they are the leaders of our congregation, called to work with me as the senior pastor and you as the congregation to nurture our family of faith, united in Christ, daring to journey together and share God's unconditional love with all people. So today I ask you to go home with but one question on your heart, and never fear for your compatriots who are not here today, I'm going to ask them again. What are the gifts that God has graced you with, and how can we as a church best help you to nurture and care for these gifts? Paul reminds us that we are called to nurture and care for our gifts and graces so that we can realize the love of God in our lives. Where we proclaim the love of God through a relationship with Jesus Christ that empowers us all to be free of sin and to live a life loved and blessed, fulfilled by the community united in Christ that we have been actually for 170 years this year. That God willing, and if we tend to our gifts and graces, we will be for another 170 years to come. And all of God's people. 